Ann Rieselbach, Program Director of the Architectural League. Welcome to the third of four nights of presentations by this year's Emerging Voices. This series is made possible through the generosity of the program sponsors. And on behalf of the League, I'd like to sincerely thank longstanding principal supporters, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown. Additional support for the Emerging Voices program is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the Next Generation Fund of the Architectural League, which is supported by a group of past Emerging Voices and League Prize winners. Architectural League programs are also supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, as well as by the members of the Architectural League. Please consider joining the League. You can find membership information on our website. Some background on the Emerging Voices for any of the audience new to the series. The program was launched 40 years ago during the Architectural League's centennial as part of the League's ongoing commitment to recognize, nurture, and share the work of young and emerging architects and designers. The League Prize for Young Architects and Designers was founded in tandem with this program. Each year, the Emerging Voices jury selects eight practices based in the United States, Canada, or Mexico through an invited juried portfolio competition that recognizes talented individuals and firms with a distinct design voice and a body of accomplished work from installations and community advocacy to explorations of fabrication methods and realized commissions or any combination thereof that has the potential to influence the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, and urbanism. To learn more about the over 300 past and recent winners and their work, including lecture videos and interviews, please check out the League's website. And you can also learn more about this year's winners through the series of articles recently published by the Architects newspaper online and in print. This year's jury examined truly accomplished examples of the breadth of contemporary architecture practice during the two-step process of selecting the winners. First, evaluating work, CVs, and design statements from about 50 firms to create a short list of candidates. They then met online to review more extensive and truly outstanding portfolios from about 20 finalists to success, select the eight to 2022 emerging voices. We are grateful for the time and expertise of the 2022 jury, Ursula Kripa, Paul Lewis, Zach Mortis, Mark Neveu, Rashida Enchi, Shalina Odbert, Susan Scott, Sarah Zoda, and Saidi Springall, who will introduce tonight's speakers. Saidi, who holds a degree in degrees in architecture from Ibero America University in Mexico City and a master's in architecture from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. She is a founding principal with Jose Castillo of the Mexican, Mexico City based firm A911, which was founded in 2002. In 2012, there were emerging voices, so we're sort of hitting them each decade since their founding here. The firm's work includes cultural, housing, and institutional buildings as well as mobility and planning projects in various cities in Mexico and Central America. Saidi's research has focused on the forms of the city and the way urban and architectural codes shape it. After the presentations by both firms, Saidi and I will follow up with conversation with the speakers and we'll also pass along questions from the audience, which you should post in the Q&A section, not the chat section, the Q&A section. Please also watch for information about CEUs, which will appear in the chat towards the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for your words, and thank all the whole team at Architectural League of New York for your invitation. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be here tonight in this important recognition for both Landing Studio and MMX Studio. As an Emerging Voice alumnus, I can tell you that these institutional and peer recognitions had made a huge impact in our practice and I am sure it will do the same to you. We celebrate the Architectural League of New York through its Emerging Voices program, recognizes and rewards diversity in architecture and its multiple ways of producing and transforming spaces. This plurality is reflected in the work that spans across scales, whether through designing a building, a streetscape, retrofitting an infrastructure, or developing a master plan. These acts of design can impact communities, cities, and territories. By recognizing the potentials of operating in these different scales, 
We can aspire to make more sustainable, inclusive and climate resilient cities. Tonight, rather than reading film profiles, that by the way are very impressive, I want to talk briefly about the build work and practices and what the jury found significant and interesting. MMX is a collaborative studio founded by Emanuel Ramirez, Ignacio del Rio, Diego Ricalde and Jorge Arbizu, based in Mexico City. I have had the fortune of knowing all team members for more than two decades. And I have been a remarkable evolution in their work. The solid trajectory of this office is the result of an absolute commitment and passion that drives the work. The diverse range of scales and programs from installation and domestic spaces to social infrastructure at large scale urban projects make the work both ambitious and relevant. One can also identify in their work thoughtful considerations about the thresholds between public and private spaces as well as the boundaries between inside and outside occasionally blurring distinctions and producing new social dynamics. The design process for MMX is always to investigate, experiment, and articulate ideas about formal, material, and programmatic strategies. Representation for them, whether through beautiful drawings or well-crafted models, is ways to discover geometries and tectonic qualities. For MMX geometry, somewhat of an obsession and constant in all their work is not an abstract order, but a system and compositional method that connects and makes evident histories, insights, conditions, and articulate them as new forms and typologies. These techniques is also used to relate the section, the elevation. Geometry and repetition produce a subtle monumentality which is also extended to detail. Overall producing surprising spaces and beautiful buildings with a commanding sense of tectonics. During the session, the jury session, everyone was really impressed about the robustness of your work that follows a very clear conceptual approach and the way you are able to deliver such powerful buildings. Though apparently different in their approach, I also found compelling the work that Landing Studio is producing across multiple territories, engaging different communities and stakeholders. Their work is based on a transformative and restorative approach to existing and abandoned infrastructures that makes them public again with important social and environment, environmental effects. Landing Studio, founded by Mary Lou Adams and Daniel Adams, is based in Somerville, Massachusetts. For them, the practice of architecture expands beyond the office. It happens in the street, in the post-industrial landscapes, in the river, in the communities, in the public agencies. Design is not only about transforming spaces. It's about politics. It's about legal aspects, about social issues, and most of all, building consensus. They describe their work as mending the problems of the past, as a way to make environmental justice and equitable public access, magnifying the quality of each intervention into the public realm for people to enjoy. Sometimes their work starts as research projects in search of a client, and in doing so, the complexities of producing a vision are redefined and opportunities for new publics created. Each of their projects is evident of the energy and energy that it's required to make them happen. There seems to be for them a professional and ethical responsibility to expand the realm of action of the architect by becoming halfway between an activist a political agent or a broker, as well as by redefining, redefining the possibilities of collaborative work in buildings and new common ground. The jury found very compelling your approach that establishes that sometimes the central site for architecture and urban design 
its previous architectures and infrastructures. And that in doing so can empower communities left out and displaced by those previous infrastructures. Do their aesthetics and formal approaches may differ in a way both MMX and Landing Studio have a similar interest in understanding and transformational possibilities of infrastructure, whether new social infrastructures in marginalized communities or the retrofitting of existing ones to produce a new real. So please welcome both MMX and Landic Studio. We are looking forward for your presentations, hearing your thoughts and seeing more of your inspiring work. So please uh, welcome uh, both students. Thank you very much. And we'll move to the presentations. Hi, hello everyone there who's behind the screen. We are Studio MMX, a Mexico City-based architectural practice. First, we would like to thank the Architectural League of New York for their exceptional organization. We are thrilled to be part of this amazing group of designers, of thinkers, creators who we admire and feel inspired by. So today we would like to share with you some insights on our work and practice and hope that this can trigger some ideas to start a conversation with you all. Estudio MMX started working from Mexico City in 2010. The Roman numeral in our name is a reminder of that moment and also it is a hint, a reference to our home country, a really interesting and complex place to see through with architectural eyes. We believe in teamwork, where dialogue and discussion can always lead to new possibilities. Estudio MMX is a group of four individuals and a diverse great group of collaborators. Uh, due to our configuration and our beliefs, teamwork stands as the main driver of our practice. Thinking, dialogue and representation are the everyday tools that allow us to conceive architectural and urban visions. From small pavilions to master planning, we do a little bit of everything. Our approach to architecture and urban design is characterized by a non-linear and systematic process which is filled and fueled by discussion, by diagrams and drawings and models, which serve as communication tools between the team, but also to convey ideas and proposals to clients, to organizations and government instances. We discuss a lot as part of a profound analytical process. Instead of ideas, we call what we do decisions, decisions that arise from a particular process of analysis of the challenge, the site, the systematic alternatives, the massing options, the geometrical coherence, the structural performance, budget, restrictions, construction, processes, and so forth. As for many other practices, every available tool is relevant for us, as long as it allows us to communicate and develop ideas throughout our design process. We include as many tools as possible, since all projects are and need complex communication strategies. However, from all the available tools, we have found in models a particular and powerful methodological element. For us, models are more truthful devices to convey, discuss, and test ideas, a representation of tool with which all participants can look at the same thing at the same time. Models thus consent us to overcome some of the interpretation and limitations and paradoxes of two-dimensional architectural representations either on paper or the screen. We take models as a means, as a vehicle for ideas, rather than an end in themselves. Aside from models, as it has been done for centuries, we also work with drawings. But we do not see drawings as means to convey the formal aspects of a design, but rather as means to communicate strategies and ideas. When synthesizing the ideas, they become diagrams, 
simple drawings that show the essence of what we are thinking and a blueprint of what will come next in the design process. However, we believe that the most powerful tool that can and should be used is simply careful thinking, an unrestricted process without a preconceived idea of what is right or what is wrong. Over the years, we have developed a series of interests that serve as a design guidelines and that have helped articulate our work. We have always been interested in landscape and its power to create space. We believe in geometry and structures as means to achieve order, coherence and beauty. Projects should be understood as a system, a set of connected elements that operate together. Complexity is not something to be pursued. Complexity is found. We always imagine intricate collections of simple associations. In our process, materiality and the construction techniques are not preconceived. The use of an, a given material is a way to convey an idea and a consequence of understanding tradition, economy, structure, efficiency, ecology, and so forth. We believe projects should strengthen the relationship between architecture and its territory. Architecture should engage strongly with the city and therefore with the people. A billion people are added to the planet every 12 to 14 years. By 2023, we will reach 8 billion people on Earth, and most will be living in cities. Mega cities such as Mexico City will continue to experience dramatic growth. In addition, we are witnessing unprecedented urban migration into cities from rural communities due to climate or political change. It has been already 10 years since there are more people living in urban settlements than in rural areas. Billions of people are seeking their own private moments in their homes or gardens within a world that has essentially become a collective mechanism. Although it provides benefits, the condition of urbanity is also exposed to very free situations, natural phenomena such as hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, the economic instability, the need for fuel or high crime rates, they become a threat to people's jobs and private spaces. So, when losing a home or having been detached from it, our sense of belonging as individuals with private moments and private everyday rituals get somehow taken and delivered. Even when there's nothing private left, we humans still have the need to make something of our own. But it's public, 
somehow needs to become private in order to provide that framework. We need to be aware of that. We need to understand that public space is for everyone as a collective group, but also as an individual. Public space cannot be restricted. It has to be open and ambiguous so that groups and individuals can find their own way of using it, of making it their own. So, what is public somehow should also become private. When designing public space, there are several issues to consider. We have a responsibility to contribute in both the cultural and the environmental local context. Although the Mexican economy pushes us towards the use of certain materials, like exposed concrete for instance, we always seek to understand what's the most suitable material for every design challenge we face. We have used chains, we have used ropes, wood, brick, concrete, steel, etc. And what we like of all of them is their capacity to teach us something different every single time. The same happens with building techniques. We often prefer techniques that result more familiar and more coherent with the site and its materials. We believe traditional technologies can be the inspiration for new universal spaces. Spaces everyone can relate to. So we know we always work within a field that is constantly shifting and evolving. We ask ourselves what will happen to a building and how this building will affect its surroundings over time. So therefore our interest always goes beyond the site. We like to conceive architecture as part of a broader context and as a response to it, the landscape, the city, the neighborhood, the people and politics are circumstances that suggest us the outline of our designs. For us, the context is the backbone that defines the guiding principles for our decisions. It provides the first main filter and defines what should or should not be done. Architecture should be born from dialogue with the community, which in most cases nourishes and informs the project of very particular situations on the site, important both for the design and to achieve a greater and better appropriation of the inhabitants with its built space. Architects should not be figures that arrive and impose but their work is a vehicle to transform those ideas, interests and concerns of the community into architecture. We have the necessity and the responsibility to achieve the maximum positive transformation with a minimum intervention. Most of our designs try to reflect upon how to produce order, articulation and coherence, not by making an object, but rather by transforming the site into more livable spaces. We like architecture that merges with the site, that explores relations of continuity between space and landscape. When designing a building with private enclosed spaces, we cannot limit our vision to a specific problem. We must think beyond that. We have the responsibility to contribute on the social and the environmental dynamics of our territory. Therefore, we need to take the opportunity and use it to give something to the common ground. We should dilute the boundaries between public and private, between closed and open. Buildings should not only be constructions. Buildings should be part of the city an extension of the public reign, reinforcing the relationship between the city and the people who live there, going beyond the program and providing a framework to complement the activities that take place in the public space. When designing public space, there are several issues to consider. We have the responsibility to contribute in both the cultural and the environmental local context. 
Our commitment is to reinforce connections between buildings and their neighbors, and to encourage encounters and social interactions. Our public spaces attempt to be flexible and non-determined. Inclusive spaces open to adaptation and evolution, spaces that are able to be transformed by the communities that use or inhabit them and that embrace their changing needs. Our public spaces explore the possibility of a spatial continuum that is not dual or gradual. These spaces are hybrid systems that explore you the positions of techniques histories, materials, expressions, and are open to interpretation and appropriation. The repetition of a simple element born from the local vernacular knowledge, forms and techniques allows to frame the space, promote flexibility, and create differentiation. Public spaces should not be flat. They can be wide, deep, and three-dimensional and have domestic scale and qualities that, that can be reclaimed by the community. All these guideline principles are to some degree present on every one of our projects, but there have been some examples where they have become more evident. Examples where we have seen at first hand how people have literally lost their private spaces. We believe that to design resilient spaces, projects should start from community participation, offering more with fewer resources, and utilizing local materials and construction knowledge. It is essential that our projects provide spaces which, which people identify over the time. From local architecture and requests from the community, we understood that the arcades we're going to be the main geometrical element that could define space with enough flexibility. So, with that simple coherent intersection operation, we were able to create a system that was both open and closed at the same time. The arcades articulate each space with the minimum built intervention possible. And at the same time, each space is defined and has its own hierarchy. As part of the comprehensive strategy of the project, architecture was understood as a natural part of the built context that defines a landscape. While maintaining existing vegetation and multiplying gardens with native vegetation, the project creates different types of gardens. Border gardens, open gardens, introverted gardens, etc. In this pre presentation, we are not trying to define a methodology to design public space or public buildings. On the contrary, we have simply shared some elements that have come across in our experience that seem to be useful in our design process. We are still figuring out how to respond through architecture to the specific needs of an ever-changing society. We have more questions than answers. How can we respond to interest of a group but to still unravel the need of each individual? How can we design something today that tomorrow we'll need to adapt to an evolving society? We're still working on public spaces and public buildings. 
and we know we still have a long way to figure this out. We hope this opens up a conversation that could help us all go into the right direction. Architecture should be a tool to improve lives. Planning Studio is focused on the design of more just and sustainable infrastructure. Our practice was formed in 2005, initially with the Rock Chapel Marine Project, which was a decade-long project to create a shared-use road salt terminal and public park that's located in a lower-income immigrant community just north of Boston called Chelsea. And at that time, while we were working really intensively in this community on the development of that project, we also spent time documenting salt production facilities at different scales all around the world. And in doing that, started to observe ways that the seemingly sort of standardized spaces of production and infrastructure could be shaped by local places and people. And that's really you know, served as an understanding for us in all of this ongoing work where we look to bring local voices and new dimensions of human delight and comfort and natural systems to everyday infrastructure spaces. We're going to share five of our projects today. Um, two of them have been fully realized and two of them are in a stage of community coalition building. Um, and then there's another final project that has been an ongoing 15 year long uh, incremental approach to redesigning the space of infrastructure and a local community. Every May at the port, salt is moved off of the basketball court. The court is restriped and it's opened again for public use. This happens on Chelsea Creek, which is an industrial waterway of Boston Harbor. The area takes in most of the state's home heating oil and jet fuel, uh, produce, as well as road salt. The port is part of the overall Rock Chapel Marine Project. Port stands for Publicly Organized Recreation Territory, and the name gets at a um, seasonally shared use space between a year-round public park on the waterfront and an industrial road salt dock. 
In the summertime, the shared use space is used for um, basketball and recreation and uh, community events. And in, in the wintertime, it's used as an expansion of the road salt stockpile. Chelsea, Massachusetts is a really dense community. It's dense with both um, residential sort of urban development and dense with industrial uh, development. In sort of recent decades, this has led to a, a strong conflict of regulation and zoning and policy where state and federal uses really push for preserving regional service of industry, while local zoning and sort of community advocates are looking for other uses of the waterfront, particularly public access. And so what's complicated is over time, those two kind of imperatives have really grown apart and in many ways prevented the waterfront from getting any form of positive development. And so what this project really looked to do was find ways to balance interests and create a new model of shared use, sort of a both-and approach to the waterfront. The former use of the site is that it was a 13 million gallon oil and asphalt batching terminal. We helped with demolition of the oil terminal in 2012 and something that we were thinking a lot about at the time was that um, the structures of the terminal really had a lot more life in them and could be repurposed for new uses in the park. Um, so we took the domes off of the oil tanks and stripped away the, the kind of cladding and they became trellis structures for vine growth and shade in the park. An oil tank dike became an amphitheater that overlooks the waterfront and things like um, the fire extinguishing cannons became new water play features for kids. An interesting effect is that now you can be sitting in the skeleton of an old oil terminal in the amphitheater under the dome, be looking across at active oil terminals as barges and tugboats and ships are passing by. The entire port landscape was designed and built using the same techniques and machines and um, workers as the salt dock. So um, all of the, the kind of landscape mounds are designed in the same way that a salt pile would be built, same angle of repose, same uh, machines are used to build it. And the reason for this was sort of a, a long-term way of thinking about the maintenance um, and management of the park over time. Um, if the salt dock workers and that business were the ones that were going to be taking care of it, it really helped that they were the ones that also built it. So they had that sort of built-in know-how of how to take care of uh, the port park. Throughout the period of demolition, we installed light projections on the oil tanks that came and went as the oil tanks were demolished. This process was undertaken in part owing to the long nature of the negotiations between federal, state, and local agencies, in this case, which took about seven years, uh, in order to create a more short-term, temporary, and sort of immediate dialogue between the city and the industries on the waterfront. The building really functions as an extension of the activities that are happening in the salt yard. It's where the truck dispatching happens, the ship stevedoring. It also creates a kind of warming center for all the workers that are um, out in the wintertime on the machines to come in and warm up. And then the second level is used as a bigger gathering space for meetings and um, training sessions and also is used for community events. Um, something that 
was happening prior to the construction of the building is that the company re operated out of a collection of construction trailers, which really limited their ability to have meetings with any more than four or five people. So this building has really created a space where um, people can come together in a different way than they could before. Boston's big dig project to put the central artery into a tunnel system below uh, downtown actually ended up creating these really large rampway viaduct landscapes um, that brought cars into that tunnel system. That's the site of this project here. And when we first encountered it, it's this space with a massive overhead rampway system and a completely undesigned ground plane just covered in gravel that separates uh, three of Boston's neighborhoods from each other, Chinatown, South Boston, and the South End. So we were brought in by the State Transportation Agency to redesign that ground plane. Two paths were built to reconnect the neighborhoods around the highway. One was a generous shared use path of asphalt, and the second was an undulating, universally accessible boardwalk that passed over the stormwater management landscape and oriented views through apertures in the highway towards major landmarks and monuments of the city. One of the really big challenges that we had to kind of think about with it is a question about implementation. Um, the project was initiated by the state's Department of Transportation and they're enabled to build transportation infrastructure but not really um, parks or public open spaces. And so that really led us to try to think creatively about how do you take the elements of transportation infrastructure and kind of arrange them in such a way that they add up to something more, um, to something much more like a park. Typically these raised viaducts drain water directly underground, out of sight, out of mind, into urban waterways, in this case the Four Point Channel extension of Boston Harbor. Uh, a key goal of this project was to daylight that system, both to bring the water flow and the contaminant streams into public consciousness so that they could be better regulated and better sort of advocated for, but it also improves access for maintenance. An interesting effect is that the trash, leaves, and other sort of debris from the roadway does become visible in a piece of the park. One of the turning points in terms of rethinking how we could use transportation infrastructure to build a park was during the design process we took a, a site walk with some of the bridge inspection team and they described to us what the process was for taking boom lifts out into the landscape and doing a visual inspection from below every few months and we began to realize that designing the space for better maintenance and inspection access could also help support recreational uses. So how could a paved space that is you know, designed, sized, and located for inspectional access also double function as something like a recreation surface or a dog park or an event space or something like that. This project builds on many of the ideas developed in the previous project with some important differences. This site is the historic emerald necklace interchange between several of the critical park systems of Boston, the Emerald Necklace, the Esplanade, and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. It was a pinnacle design in the 1880s of green infrastructure relationship between urban systems, roadways and paths, recreation and natural systems that were used for drainage and flood storage through the muddy river. And so many of the ambitions of this project are to restore those sort of green infrastructure ambitions to today. Additionally, this project is being developed across two different perspectives. On one hand, a group of community organizers and advocates through the Charles Gate Alliance and the Emerald Necklace Conservancy and the Esplanade Association 
have come together through a community uh, process to develop a community-led vision of what should be the design priorities to restore and improve this landscape. Simultaneously, the Mass Department of Transportation is confronting the fact that this infrastructure built in the urban renewal federal highway era is coming to end of life and needs to be replaced. Over the course of several months, we worked with the community to develop an initial set of design principles for the site um, to prioritize connectivity both through and across the area um, to improve water quality, to bring in new activities to kind of activate the space and invite people into it, and then to also, you know, enhance historic features that were um, still sprinkled around the landscape. One of the reasons that it was really difficult to get traction here is that there's such an entanglement of different jurisdictional authorities that really complicates ownership and responsibility. And we realized that in order to move a plan forward, we really needed to think through who's responsible for and how will this landscape be maintained. The sort of complexity of ownership and responsibility is really exemplified here in um, how water is managed. Currently, if a drop of water falls on the overpass above, it passes through three or four different jurisdictional combinations before it drains into the river. So one of the, the kind of big first design efforts that we made was to really research and draw out, you know, what were the existing um, systems of ownership on the site and use that as a way to um, kind of build consensus with all of the different agencies to clarify responsibility and create a more simple way and a more sustainable way of managing stormwater in a way that would also start to enhance the, the kind of experience of the park itself through green infrastructure. This project was initially made possible by um, the Leventhal City Prize at MIT Center for Advanced Urbanism that called for proposals in urban design and planning that explore new models for equitable resilience. The Malden River developed as an industrial waterway and today the uses that surround it are still industrial, they're all privately owned and today with the risk of climate change, sea level rise and flooding from storms, um, a lot of the planning issues are really challenging here because of the private ownership. The Malden River Works parcel is the only uh, city-owned parcel on the river itself, so the project is meant to serve as an example uh, for what could be done to create a more resilient framework around the entire river. We were part of a team of um, environmental advocates and Malden residents who were looking to create new public access on the Malden River. The students captured the river, its beauty, its challenges. We've really accomplished a lot so far um, since we started in 2019. And then also social resilience. Um, we know that 
you know, that in order for the Malden River to become fully protected, it's going to take a lot of coordination and collaboration across a variety of different property owners. The project tries to look at resilience in a multi-layered way in terms of economic resilience. The idea that um, this could serve as an example for how to preserve industrial uses on the river and also bring in new um, dimensions of climate resilience through um, green space. The DPW is also a second responder, so in terms of disaster recovery, they're the group that you know, can clear streets, repair roads, remove debris, and so on. So it's really important to think about um, protecting this facility as a key piece of infrastructure in the city. So something we thought we could do with this project is build a community coalition who's going to um, carry on this work beyond the scale of or the time of, of just this project itself, but really think about resilience as a long-term effort in the city. This last project returns to Chelsea, Massachusetts, to Marginal Street, site of Rock Chapel Marine in Port Park. We've been working on this project since 2004 as a series of incremental improvements to the relationship between the city and the industry. This longer term engagement with the infrastructure of the industry and the city has allowed relationships to build and projects to aggregate one atop the other. An example would be that just a couple of years ago we expanded a community garden into a new urban farm and now a couple of years later that is expanding to convert an old um, mill building into a teaching kitchen with a hospital group and environmental advocacy organization. These incremental projects include new landscapes like plazas, community gardens, or pocket parks. It includes events like theater in the park, or light projections, or charity events, or festivals. It includes architectural improvements for things like converting historic homes into worker housing, and things like new garages for the workers. Um, it also includes uh, sort of infrastructures like um, street front landscaping or temporal infrastructures like the creation of a COVID food hub um, during the pandemic. These projects are designed to take advantage of the unique capacity and labor force and seasonality of the infrastructure. Workers who might spend the, the winter months operating machines to move salt uh, and working on the dock in the summertime become involved with landscaping projects or building stages for theater in the park. Additionally, the salt industry has a, a wide network of hundreds of contractors and subcontractors like welders, electricians, mechanics, divers, whose unique skill sets can sort of be recalibrated for these community projects. We try to design these projects to take best advantage of these capacities, uh, wherein moving heavy equipment or materials or large rocks on most sites would be really difficult and costly. Here, with the scale of equipment and labor know-how, such sort of large maneuvers are much easier and very efficient. The result is a unique material palette that's both very robust and resilient to the sort of industrial comings and goings of the neighborhood, 
but is also part of then the kind of maintenance and care routines of the industry because they're working with materials that they're familiar with. A common material you'll see across many of these projects are multi-ton granite quarry blocks that are salvaged from old granite seawalls throughout the area or from old granite bridge abutments. Again, these are the types of materials that would be very challenging to move in a typical construction site, but here are actually some of the most resilient materials for the equipment to work with. This way of working has allowed us to look beyond the confines of the industrial or infrastructural landscape itself and look at how the spaces that mediate the scene between heavy industry and the city could be recalibrated to create a better relationship. Amazing work and very inspiring in both presentations. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your work and your ideas in these fantastic videos and congratulations in the way you have contributed with fresh approaches to the profession that needs to be reimagined to address new challenges we have every day. So amazing, I envy uh, you both works and now I think we, we, we want to move to open some questions so the audience can also engage in the conversation. So uh, I have a couple of questions for both studios. So my first question is for Landing Studio. Uh, and I would like to ask how has the place like Somerville or the greater Boston area shaped your ideas about expanded practice of architecture? I think our, our, you know, we've said a lot of times that a lot of what drives our work is being able to be very close to where it happens. Um, I think all of the projects that we've shared have sort of unfolded for a very long time frame, and um, the ideas evolved because we're so close to be able to, you know, visit sites, you know, whenever we want to to kind of um, see what's happening on them and and kind of keep our ideas um, flexible and open during the, the sort of design process. And we found that like when we try to work um, in places that aren't so close by that some of that richness that comes from, you know, letting um, something sort of cook slowly doesn't happen as much. Um, so we really feel like a lot of our work is is very much driven by being close to the sites and people that we work with. Yeah, it's, it's also a place where we just have a lot of sort of, um, you know, kind of big infrastructure sometimes that wasn't, you know, Boston's a really smart city in one way, we have so many universities, and then on the other hand, some pretty bad planning decisions at times, and it's a state of change as maybe all cities are. 
And so there, we work a lot at these kind of intersections that are both physical intersections in space and sort of intersections in time of like changes that the city is undergoing for maybe good or bad. And so there's just a lot of these kind of interfaces that aren't particularly well conceived or well designed. We really like in uh, the Studio MMX, the kind of public private discussion, for example, on what you design and what you don't design and taking sort of full accountability of that. We, we see so many aspects of the environment that are kind of um, uh, results, but not intentions. And that need to be that in many ways define the spaces almost more than the intentional design. And so kind of trying to rectify those relationships um, drives our work. Wonderful, thanks. And there's another one that connects a little bit with this, with the first question that is, can you expand a bit of what you consider active infrastructures and the biggest challenges you face in terms of technical and political work? Yeah, um, Alma, I think every project that we shared was, was a site of active infrastructure. And what that means to us is that we really have to think about um, sort of the, the ongoing life of the, the space um, in that it doesn't stay the same from day to day. Um, it's something that's sort of taken care of and, um, and we really have to incorporate that thinking into the work that we do. So we spoke a lot about that in the presentation in terms of thinking about maintenance, um, you know, working with maintenance staff and kind of hearing what they need to do and how they need access and so on is something that has driven a lot of the design ideas for us and um, opened up a lot of possibilities for us as well um, for all of the, the projects. But it ties to your earlier kind of question is, you know, Boston is certainly in a state of change of going from sort of an industrial city to often referred to as this sort of post-industrial. And we often think that's a really problematic term or concept because off, obviously Boston as it's growing it's consuming more and more than it ever has this was again touched upon in Mexico City so the idea that it's becoming post-industrial is a falsehood it just means that the industry is kind of like not visible to people it's coming in on trucks and planes and ships and and then there's these kinds of landscapes that become the kind of plug-in points where those systems still engage with the city and so often in our work, people get confused because they say, oh, like, nice, you're converting an industry to something new because that's so typical in, in a way in cities, uh, at least on the East Coast of the United States. So when we say active, what we're really referring to in the sort of simplest way possible is that they are still functional infrastructure industrial terminals. So they're still moving a million tons of salt or they're still million, you know, moving hundreds of thousands of cars. And that those systems, we can't just pretend are leaving cities, need to be resolved <laughs> with cities. Please feel free to continue to put questions in the Q&A section. I've got some follow-up questions, but I think we should turn to MMX for a little bit first. And Saidi, you've got some questions drafted there too. So. You're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens. I have a couple of questions and for MMX. How do you understand and leverage your individual contributions, contributions in the design, communication, and building process? Uh, we we think that's something strong about the office that we are for, and we contribute a lot of different views. And, and sometimes it's really hard because, so, because putting a, an idea on a table, you have to be open to receive all the critics from, the, from, the, from your partners. And, and it also helps to, to know which part of the project, uh, which part of the project has a, a strong, uh, strong partner on, on it. I, I, I don't know. It's clear. Uh, each of us has a, a strong uh, experience in, in different areas. And so we, we always expect 
that the, that partner uh, collaborates more in that in that kind of ideas. Does someone else of uh, Manuel, uh, Diego, or Nacho wants to add something to this question? Okay, it's okay. No, I, I think Nacho is speaking, but uh, he's muted. Ah. Yep. Well, well, no, no. I think it's kind of the same, which I would say, but it's only we are. We think that's kind of the 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 risk is also like the the strong part. It's always that duality, and we just bet into into we are going to have more into in by that risk that that only a very consistent yeah i believe it's always a, a challenge but but i always say that more heads had more ideas so uh, you're trying to work with that i think it's, it's just amazing and you get the, you can get the best of the best uh, with many, many uh, ideas and many, many interventions. So yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Nacho and, and Jorge. So the second one is, uh, has to do with, how would you say that your recent projects of social infrastructure reshape your attitudes about form, geometry, and civic monumentality? Well, that's a, a difficult question. Uh, we, when we started 10 years ago, and uh, of course, when you start an office like ours, we always hope to get to, to, uh, to design these public spaces. You know, they are, when you're studying architecture, you're always seeking to get to, uh, to reach this, this you know, larger group of, of people and get to do something that somehow changes and reshapes the way uh, people, how people live, how, how people think. And you always have all these, these things in your mind that you wanna, you wanna explore. And when you opened, uh, when we started the office 10 years ago, it took us a, a long way you know, to get to build a, a public project. So we had to start with you know, like small uh, projects for families and then you, you do a house and then you do a little bit more. So uh, when you say like the, the recent public projects, it's, it's funny because it's in, in our case, the public projects, uh, they started not so, not so long ago. We started uh, designing public spaces. Of course, we did some pavilions, public pavilions that somehow help you to understand and to test some of the ideas. Uh, but we started to do um, projects that were not temporary installations, uh, where you have, uh, you know, a weight in your shoulders. You know, you're gonna you're gonna leave something there, uh, yeah. probably not forever, but you know, you're gonna be uh, probably uh, blamed and uh, you know many other things uh, for uh, if you do it wrong. So uh, it, I, I think the question is really interesting because when we started doing um, social projects. It somehow reshaped the way we we had to react to the to to these challenges because when you have uh, a, a project like a private house or, or or office building or you have a, a client that most of the time knows exactly what they want and they they keep on telling you if you are right or you're wrong you know they they sort of guide you through this you know like uh, labyrinth uh, of decisions. Whereas uh, in public space uh, or public buildings, at least in Mexico City, uh, you have to act really quick. I mean, you, Saidi, uh, uh, you know, and of course I, I'm, I'm assuming that you know you guys, uh, uh, Daniel and Marie, know that as well. That you have to somehow make decisions for people that you 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 actually don't know, or you know, for a public or a, or a group of people that it, that it's. Is not probably your everyday life. It's not going to be another group, and somehow that changes the way you need to operate. That's why uh, 
these, these uh, sort of um, principles, very open and very ambiguous that could allow um, flexibility and could allow uh, evolution, uh, you know, they, they come into place, uh, which, which might not happen in private projects. You know, you need to create geometries that would allow different programs because of course, you know, uh, probably somebody told you that, you know, this, is, this space is gonna be used for this specific use. But probably the uh, the community is gonna find its own way or evolve so that it needs another thing to happen there. So that you know we need to these discussions among us were really interesting, where we were uh, trying to come up with geometries, as you said, with a structural system that were somehow universal, specific enough, but you know uh, not so specific so that they could change. so uh, 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 a sport uh, a sports facility you know a court could be also changed and become an auditorium or become uh, uh, the space for a, a market or or something like that and and that's where decisions start to to apply different in social uh, architecture than they do in, in in privates so i think you know it goes somewhere around there and you have to make decisions really quick so you have to make decisions that are broader in terms of uh, their impact and their uh, way of being flexible, you know, in the future. Absolutely, I believe that the social projects are always challenging, but they expand the possibilities and the exploration in the work. So in a way it's like challenging, but also gives like another a scale and another way to expand our knowledge. So I can see that in your work, that that exploration about geometry and repetition, it's more easy to happen in these spaces, in these social spaces. So thank you for your, for your answer. I, I would, oh, sorry. If, if, if I can, I, I would add just a couple of things. Emmanuel was saying that we have to take quick decisions and that's something that in many ways characterize uh, Mexico and, and how we work, time, uh, and also Landing Studio was speaking about processes that are slow and that take time. And, and for us, many times the, the reality is a, li a little bit or, or, a, or much different uh, than that. No? Our times operate in a different way. Uh, but you were asking uh, also about geometry. We said in the presentation, geometry for us is a tool, and I think it will remain as that, as a tool that we use all the time, because that's the way, as we said, uh, our way to find order and, and to understand things. And that's also a common ground and a common language between us and the team and etc. Then you were talking about the form. We always talk, we always say that form in our projects, or at least we we like to see it that way, is, is the result of, of the decisions, the operations, etc. Uh, but an and architecture has to have a form. Uh, maybe uh, the form could uh, uh, move into a, into something that has to do more with the action rather than reactions. That's maybe a task we have to take on. And you also were talking about monumentality, something that we already we have talked about that. Uh, that's something that uh, a lot of architects out from Mexico, especially from Latin America, say about the Mexican architecture. And that could, could uh, be seen as a given, but uh, how this idea or this sense of monumentality will change, I guess uh, it will change and we will keep trying to understand how it can, how it can change if it has to, that I think it, it has to, but how, what are the mechanisms that, that can um, uh, approach us to, to, to change that, uh, that sense of monumentality in the, in the projects? Also because the size of the country and the size of these decisions and the, the political implications of things are, are, are also that big. And maybe that's why many times there is this, this sense. And um, lastly, uh, I think one of the, the, the things that have informed our process, all these series of projects is to incorporate listening. And, and I am, I hope that that continues like that. Uh, many times architects don't listen. 
And I think we've reached, not we as, a, as a, an architectural practice, we as a society and societies, we've reached a time where uh, we, have to, we have to start really listening. And it's already happening, it's not immediate, but uh, it's already happening. And I think that- I'm gonna um, jump in now and combine, a, a, well, a couple of questions for Landing Studio. I'm gonna take one ahead and combine it with one from the audience. Um, and mine was informed also by Sarah Wessler who interviewed you um, on the piece that was just recently published on our website. Um, your projects seem by their very nature to be open-ended both in terms of the continued cultivation and maintenance of the natural landscape, as well as the evolving community and industrial activities in use. And could you describe the kind of ongoing relationship with stakeholders your active infrastructure requires? And is there a tricky balancing act between the active industrial use and the ecological concerns and you know, recreational use? And then I wanna um, add a, a question that an anonymous attendee um, has added as part of that. And that's, were you ever intimidated by the scale and complexity of the the um, infrastructure you were working in, which I think is part and parcel of that same question. I think there's an open-endedness in the way we try to look at our work. And then there's there are some projects that are truly long-term and, and kind of exist beyond you know, a single architectural act. Um, but something like the, the second project that we showed, um, the Infraspace one, was probably the most discrete project that we've done in an infrastructure space that had a starting and an ending. But we have really drawn a lot from that project into later work that we've done. Starting to work in sort of um, highway landscapes has proven to be something that, you know, once you, you do it, you learn so many ways of, of working. A lot of the issues are, are common in, from site to site. And, so even though that project had a more discrete starting and ending point, it's something that really kind of carries on in a lot of the other work that we do. I think we've been very fortunate that the clients that we've gotten engaged with, like the specific clients, and clients is often a kind of a complicated term in our work, but are <clears throat> um, in like organizations, agencies, whose like express model of functioning is a maintenance-based model, not a development-based model. So industries are not developers, they're maintenance people. You know, they're, if you're building a mine, it's something you build forever. It's about maintaining the mine. If you build a port, it's about maintaining the port. Um, and same with like a highway department, you know, what they spend 99% of their time doing is not building new bridges, it's maintaining the like vast networks of infrastructure. And, and so it inherent to those relationships, I think it's for our architects, I, we, we reflect on this a lot as how often architects are kind of limited by the nature, the very nature of the discipline actually of, you know, single contracts with single groups for discrete amounts of times with fixed amounts of, you know, capital, um, which I honestly don't think is good for the projects nor is it good for architects. <laughs> it means you're sort of uh, always running for new projects. That kind of model, and especially when you put it in the context of sustainability and how do you actually generate sustainability, which is fundamentally a long-term question of ongoing relationships and iterative nature and adaptability. The idea that you would ever put a structure in a place, leave it and walk away uh, and not be sort of responsible for its care and maintenance is almost antithetical <laughs> to sustainability. So the sort of beauty of working with these agencies and industries and infrastructure is that core to their business. It also then means they often, I think one of the things, and I love with the studio MMX keeps using this word tool, which I think we think a lot about as well, is like, how are we tools for those agencies? And what are the tools that we can bring to bear? And we're, we sometimes really love the kind of radical results that something like a salt terminal can all of a sudden see that a basketball court can make their operations more sustainable. And so this kind of weird delirious character of seemingly very oppositional programs in the context of trying to build a sustainable relationship 
can lead to new programmatic juxtapositions and relationships, which far like as the studio MMX is talking about as well, ultimately lead to new forms and new space. I thought you were going to say with that, like that also works interestingly with working with public agencies too, because once you test a design, it's something that can then be reproduced much more easily. Um, so some of the, the projects that we did with our first work with the highway department then get adopted into their standard set of specifications and actually can go through a much less arduous process of approvals in order to be used in another project. So you start to work through the design of prototypes. And that's something that we thought was really exciting. We clearly can't kind of, you know, continue working on every project for an infinite amount of time um, as architects, but there are ways of, of testing ideas that can be. Um, well, I want to, I, I just want to add to that, I guess, and then I'll be quiet. But the, um, uh, you know, we do a lot of work with lawyers and politicians as part of this work, because so many of these systems transcend city versus state versus federal regulations. And one of the things we've really learned is that law and architecture has such a sort of inherent marriage that laws, particularly as it comes to governing infrastructure and industry, have to be written on lowest common denominator understandings of what's like the capacity of an infrastructure. So like take something like simple zoning in cities, you almost have to zone industry away from communities because we have a history of badly designing industry and infrastructure. As soon as you have new models of design, well, then that can push legislation and policy in new directions because there's new precedent, new case for which policy and legislation can be written. And so that kind of model of interagency sort of even translation of project to project really manifests in that dance between architecture and policy, architecture and legislation. So we're kind of always looking for ways to create new typological programs or forms that can honestly sort of push the boundary of regulation. It, you know, this feeds right into a comment and question from Rosalie Ginevra, the league's executive director, um, commented on how beautiful your work is, and but noted you both teach, which is likely part of what makes the non-traditional nature of your projects and practice possible. And can you imagine other practice structures that could support or make possible the kind of work you do? And I would add, you know, that it always strikes me that the model of landscape architecture practice is so different than architecture practice because the idea of being finished is the beginning with one and the ending with the other. So any comments on? Well, Rosalie's right and not totally right. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> academic uh, certainly helps uh, with certain fundamental life sustainability issues, but also takes away a lot of time. No, I actually think the model of working, I mean, that's why I was commenting before. It's, I think the discipline of architecture has done itself a great disservice of turning itself into these contract-based projects of single project. Like actually, take something like the salt work that has been a constant client for us since 2004 that we've been on a constant relationship with, which honestly is much more consistent with things like law, where lawyers are on, on like constant retainers <laughs> with companies. Um, that both changes the model of how we can practice as an architect because we have a stable relationship. It's almost, we're not employees of that, but we're essentially on call constant. And that's not a new model. That's actually a very historic model of looking at people like Albert Kahn and the relationship with Ford or uh, Barron's and the AEG turbine. But architects really moved away from that model um, in part in the pursuit of the kind of one-off global um, uh, you know, celebration of an architect sort of dropping into a place. This kind of local engagement, I actually think is a much more sort of sustainable model even for architectural practice is a, you know, I'm biased. This actually leads into a question for MMX, which I've been mispronouncing, Exis. Um, and uh, one of the audience questions feeds into one of the questions I had. Um, so I'll start with theirs, um, asking if there are any, if there's cultural intersection that informs your work, um, indigenous communities, colonial influences. And I had a question, you do talk about how local building traditions and materials influence your work. I mean, how, can you give an example of how a project was shaped by local traditions, both formally and, and materially? We, we tried to work with uh, the local uh, materials 
and also with the local techniques because we 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 feel like the the people that are uh, made in the the constructions they know best uh, to manipulate their their own knowledge of on a specific material we we cannot go as a high tech uh, uh, project or construction because we we don't have those tools we try to work with 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 the tools that we have and uh, and with the uh, uh, one one thing is also very important that Diego was telling about the the timing of the Mexican projects. Uh, it, it, it's funny because it's it's very different how Nani Studio have uh, the approach to the projects. We we uh, we wanted to have this the community participation, but we don't have that time. We will would love to to include every every aspect and, and analysis and have a lot of meetings, but we just have uh, in the public project, we just have a, like a couple of meetings. And, and from that, we have to pull everything and, and, and hope that people like what they uh, have as a result. Uh, and so each, each project has uh, give us uh, something to learn about uh, how to inter interpret the community, what, how to interpret what people are used to, what people need. So we're still learning about that. Yeah, well, I'd like to add, to add uh, well, uh, we are, in mainly in what we present today, we we, we hadn't be as local as landing. So we have work like in different places, and we have to like to, to adapt in different situations to that. So uh, what what I think it's uh, important in that situation for us in in those different contexts. Uh, in terms of materials and techniques and the people that it's going to be uh, building the, the, the things, it's that it has to be something or what we aim to do is it has to be something that they can make their own. So uh, they have to be, they have to, it has to be something that it's related to them, and that's kind of the the the, the main goal of that. So, uh, so we try to figure out uh, which is or, or which are the like the the best materials and the best techniques for for that for every different situation. No, it's uh, even it's a. Uh, a courtyard or, or just a roof for that uh, it can be made like uh, with any material the structure could be like very efficient and it would be like in different places it could be the same one which which is something that uh, in mexico happens a lot you know, there's uh, like this very efficient uh, roof that's put in every single little town in the in different courtyards but that kind of make like a, a, a terrible landscape and, and absolutely absence of uh, relate relations to the locality and I think that's the opposite we are looking for. So we try to work with different materials and different types of techniques in order to, to like, if we are not what, what we look at and we learn from every place in our visits and well, the analysis of that also. We um, promised you at the outset that we'd ask each of you to ask a question of the other. So who'd like to go first? Uh, 
we've been trying to formulate a question, but we have a series of comments and I just want to first say, I mean, it's very important to note. I mean, I think your work is just stunningly beautiful. I mean, one thing I, I find profound is actually, and I think you've kind of touched on it a bit, but just the way you dance across materials, I just want to say, I think you've mastered so many materials. Uh, we appreciate the detailing uh, greatly. I'll try and formulate this into a question. It's more a comment that I'd love to have just hear more from you about. I mean, we there was there's a number of overlaps with our own ways of thinking about things. Um, you talked initially, you kind of introduced architecture as a series of decisions of, and then quite like that. And then you discussed the the concept, which we agree in architecture is often overlooked of decisions about what you do and what you don't do or should do or shouldn't do. Um, and then, so that decision-making process, and then in this conversation, you've also revealed how you're often, and I can understand where this comes from, sort of hand-tied a little bit because of the speed, perhaps, through which the projects come and the degree. So that kind of, why I, I think why we're intrigued by the should or should not do question that you raised, we confront that a lot in the notion of really thinking about the kind of impacts of our work in spaces um, and trying to be as responsible to those because so often infrastructure has like not been responsible. So that kind of concept of like the positive of what you do and the negative of what you do in the decision-making process, um, I, I'd love to just sort of hear more about that in your work. Um, I don't know if that's fair, but it was just something that really resonated in your uh, conversation. We were talking about that while you were presenting. Well, um, it, it is uh, it is interesting, but it is difficult to to answer because when you're designing, as you said, uh, most of the time it's not about uh, finding the only way of doing certain a certain design because there's as, as uh, Ignacio was saying, there's um, many ways of doing the same thing. But at the same time, uh, it's easier for us uh, when we always say what well, we said at the, as, as you uh, pointed out, uh, is not necessarily a design, it's, it's a set of decisions, you know, of what to do and what not to do. And usually it's easier to understand what is what you, you don't need to do. So, uh, so, so, so it's it's easier not to be wrong if you are sort of uh, trying to understand what can come up wrong in a, uh, you know whether it's in the design process or in the construction technique or in the way the community is gonna is gonna use these spaces uh, or uh, budget uh, budget concerns etc. Uh, I, I almost can say that we we sort of work with the don'ts you know don't let's not do this. Let's not do that. And that sort of, uh, you know, narrows down the options. And then we have a set of options, you know, and that set of options, it's easier to, uh, to, to navigate through those because you, you are at little bit, you know, to some extent, you are certain that you're not gonna blow it, you know, at, at a certain, you know, at scale. So, so at least you're not gonna uh, have this wrong or this, you know, you, of course, we are learning as, as Jorge was saying, and we're still going to be learning, you know, as it goes uh, through what we do, because in you know, architecture, every single project, and I was really amazed by the, uh, by the, you know, the, 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 the price that you shown to us, because they're all somehow in, it's, it's one theme, you know, like how, you know, the, the industry, uh, as you were saying, you know, moves, and then, you know, you have to somehow find a way to reintegrate the public realm into an infrastructure that you know still has a purpose, but you know, uh, you know, it doesn't have. It, it, it was not shaped originally to be part of the the public realm, and it, it is a debate of how do you uh, sort of find a hinge through through what you do between between these elements. And uh, I think for us, it, it is somehow the same thing. We need to understand at each project. Uh, what are the main actors and uh, what are the main confrontations that, you know, these spaces or buildings could have, you know, what, what would be, you know, the, uh, the interaction uh, that we might foresee somehow. And uh, with that in mind, and that's the most difficult discussion, it's not the design. 
it is it is uh, what are you aiming you know what are you giving what is the framework we are providing to this uh and that's where these questions or these decisions that you were you were uh, referring uh start to to have more weight you know uh uh you know we really want to this to happen and then you know how do we make uh, something that you know can somehow make this happen uh and then the answers start to come or some answers and uh, and that's somehow this this process i i think of, of decision making that we do have here in the office and how about back at landing studio question for them um uh, well i have a couple of questions maybe um one is, uh, I, I like a lot uh, your, your projects, congratulations. And uh, I was thinking as you, as we were looking at your presentation, if you see these projects as hybrids in the way, in, in the sense that um, in the future, I mean, for you, because this infrastructure with which you work all the time, uh, do you think it's going to, always be there it is is it going to be pushed away in a certain moment and then what will happen with with, with these ideas is that your 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 uh, goal so to speak you know that a world that doesn't have this infrastructure or a world and, and maybe you already answered a little bit of this but a world that actually has infrastructure because it needs it but there is this kind of way to work with and within and, and thinking of these hybrids that are very, very interesting. Uh, one of the things that also uh, called my attention was the, the part where you, you talk about how these uh, parks or interventions, actions, uh, special actions, uh, show with the water, how the, the water is being treated and, and uh, uh, collected and so on. So uh, do you think that architecture is, can be, or has to be also an educational device that speaks about these things uh, for people uh, that are, that is actually showing materially and physically uh, all these infrastructural problems or functioning problems or, 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 or conditions of the city. And, and if, if um, uh, that's one of the, also the, the, the objectives of, of what you do, and lastly, if you think, because you, you've talked a lot about work, work, working locally, but if these ideas of yours, even if it's not by you, are uh, replicable in other places, and uh, because one of the things that uh, is most impressive for me when I go to the, to the States is to see all this infrastructure you have, but also, this the, the fragility it, it shows because uh, whenever uh, there is no enough money, time, interest, decisions, etc., this all this infrastructure could collapse so quick that that would pose, let's say, a lot of questions that I think relate with what you do. There are a lot of good questions. And I don't I have think a lot of have. thoughts. I, don't know those I am sorry. Thank you. Thanks well, but I mean, no, we've been reflecting on a lot. I mean, yeah. take your last point. We reflect on this a lot, and it's it's devastatingly frustrating in a way. You know, with all the investments that are being made in the United States right now, it's you know, I don't know how much it's being talked about in Mexico City, but we have a lot of major infrastructure. And how often we see that all of our contemporary investments have to simply go to repairing all of the infrastructure we already have. So how is it that we can sort of, let's say, um, improve the con sort of the conditions or the type of infrastructure where we're sort of buried with the responsibility of maintaining what we have <laughs> since we are such an infrastructurally heavy context. And so something like the project, which ties together a few of your comments, we started working, we showed with the Emerald Necklace here in Boston. And it's a very fascinating project, really hitting on what you're describing, because fundamentally, it's a man-made drainage system for a city designed to look like a park 
function like a park and look like a river. And the irony of it is because it's kind of designed to kind of look like a river, it sort of starts to function like a river and people start to almost love it as if it's a river. They even call it a river, even though it never was a river. It was never a river. It was an inland waterway. And so to your point about, and there's so many interesting lessons embedded in that we find. So on one hand, it's, a, it's a effectively an urban pipe for getting stormwater out of the city, and yet it's an urban pipe that supports migrating fish and birds and people recreate on it. And people actually care enough about it because it looks like a river that they actually even try and clean it up. It's like, you know, what's the last time someone went to try and clean up a pipe? But the the does, but then interestingly, because it looks like a river, people are even on the other hand very confused by it. They think it's a river. And so it's even called a river. And that's very disempowering at the same time, uh, because people don't even know what they're looking at. Um, uh, and so that's a big aspect of our work is if we always take our industry and our infrastructure and we jam it miles and miles away from a city and we simply, you know, flip a light switch, but don't see that someone's, you know, breathing that light switch or that we don't, well, then you're never going to confront that reality. And it really disempowers people to make decisions about how they relate to their own infrastructure. And so we think the kind of contemporary practice of simply moving industry and infrastructure kind of out of sight and out of mind is really disempowering people from participating. And the friction of the city immediately sort of brings that infrastructure into negotiation with people. So they have to contend with the realities of it. And it has to either be designed better or it has to go away. <laughs> um, and so there's a, it's just sort of too easy to push these things out of the city. And it's led to, I think, a lot of the kind of, you know, contemporary realizations about climate change that, of course, even if you push it out of the city, it doesn't go away. <laughs> it, it, it just, we use it more, we consume it more, we become more ignorant of it. And architecture, unfortunately, and plays a really, you know, important role in building how we relate to that infrastructure. And a lot of the ways we build are intentionally designed to kind of hide that messiness from us, is to make an environment seem clean and to make it seem, um, you, know, you know, cared for, or, you know, considered, when the reality is it's often a mask hiding many of our own operations from ourselves. And so I think a lot of our interest is how do you get people into these environments? How do you make them more transparent? How do you make them more honest? So that people at least have to kind of confront the reality of what they're doing and can therefore make wiser decisions about it. That addresses a couple of your <laughs> questions. Right. Citing really any, comments, so. any last comments on your part? No, I will say that we can extend this conversation for days. I mean, and that's because there's a lot of a lot of things to say and a lot of ideas and knowledge and experiences to share. So I think there's many similarities in the work these both studios create. I mean, probably with some difference in timing, some difference in the way they happen. So, but, but at the end, I believe that we are all, or you are all working with the same challenges. And I think that's really amazing for architecture because we can think of architecture as a very broad uh, way of understanding interventions we can do. So I really appreciate listening all your, your intelligence uh, in doing your, your work and to try to contribute to better, to, to, to bring a better world uh, that now is very needed. So thinking, and I will say like in, in the whole uh, winners for this, uh, 2022 Emerging Voices, it was very nice to see the whole, uh, uh, the whole um, spectrum of different ways of, uh, of, of doing architecture. And that's very uh, inspiring and very, it brings to us a very reflexive time to think about how can we can impact our cities and our communities. So thank you very much. Uh, it's just amazing to see all your work and thank you for your time. And thank you, Anne, uh, for inviting me for this uh, presentation. And I hope.
hope to see you soon and we can expand our conversation. And to everyone um, hanging out still, please come back, same time, same sort of place, next week for the last night of lectures um, by this year's Emerging Voices, Seku Cook and Azra Aksamija. Um, very different approaches to design and design vocabulary, but part of the same large, larger conversation. So we look forward to seeing you next week.